Hello and welcome to the NMC educational series. The objective of this program is to discuss the common day-to-day -day cases uh, faced by the pediatricians and the physicians and to provide the most practical and the evidence-based solution through a discussion with the experts in their field. Today's topic of discussion is recurrent urinary tract infection in children. To discuss this, we have with us today Professor Pramod Reddy, Consultant and the Divisional Director of Pediatric Urology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, United States. Welcome, Professor. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Dinesh. Appreciate it. Professor, I want to ask you a few questions that uh, haunts the pediatricians on a daily basis. Why do children get recurrent urinary tract infection? Recurrent urinary tract infections, about 20 to 30 percent of children who have their first time urinary tract infection will get a second infection. And when there is a reinfection of the child, it's with the same organism. When they're getting multiple infections with different organisms, that's what we would call a recurrent infection. And that distinction is important because sometimes a reinfection means that the initial infection wasn't correctly treated. Now, the risk factors for a child getting recurrent infections, we can break them down into two components. One is the host factors. What are the child's own intrinsic factors that are making them prone to these infections. And then the second part is the, um, the bacterial factors, or the agent factors that, what is the virulence factors of the bacteria that are making them cause a infection in an otherwise normal host. So let's look at the things that happen in a child's body that make them at risk for infections. Probably the one most important thing that is underappreciated by a lot of parents and also doctors is the fact that a lot of children who get recurrent urinary tract infections tend to be constipated. And why is this an issue? Um, the physical manifestation of constipation where the rectum is over distended puts a lot of pressure on the bladder and makes the bladder become a little bit dysfunctional. Uh, wherein the bladder doesn't empty well, it becomes a high pressure storage system. Under normal circumstances, the bladder should be a low pressure system that empties completely. So the fact that it's a high pressure system with incomplete emptying allowing some stasis of urine, that by itself is a big risk factor for infections. The other uh, protective mechanisms that our urinary bladder has that it reduces the likelihood of causing infections is that within the bladder, the urethelial cells secrete a glycoprotein, a glycosamine glycan, which is called a gag layer. And that gag layer is kind of like a force field within the lining of the bladder that protects bacteria from adhering. If the bacteria don't adhere to the urethelium, they can't penetrate and can't cause an infection. So when you have a high pressure system uh, in the bladder, that gag layer is deficient or becomes fragmented. And now our first layer of defense against infections is broken down. The second thing about the high pressure in the urinary tract is that uh, between the urethelium and the lamina propria is a very fine meshwork of blood vessels. And it's these blood vessels that are perfusing the inner layer of the bladder. When you have a high pressure system, that blood flow in that uh, layer is deficient. It's not properly perfusing. And so again, we're breaking down the uh, defense mechanisms of the bladder that promote the risk of infections. Other things that can cause uh, children to have recurrent infections are in, you know, dysfunctional voiding, where the child either holds too long and they have something called uh, urethral backwashing, where the bladder is having unanimous contractions and with every contraction a little bolus of urine goes into the urethra just beyond the bladder neck and then washes back when that contraction stops. So they're constantly washing bacteria from the urethra into their bladder. The infrequent voider where they don't go to the bathroom frequently, they're not washing out the urethra completely. Every two to three hours when we go to the bathroom, you eradicate all the bacteria that have gone to the urethra. And a child who voids once every eight hours during the daytime they're not doing that and so they're just increasing the bacterial load that the urinary tract is being exposed to and it overwhelms their immune system. Lastly, you, know, you have children who are immunosuppressed, uh, either medication-wise, iatrogenically by doctors who are doing this. They can have recurrent infections. Uh, a chronically indwelling foreign body can also increase the risk of uh, recurrent infections. And also sometimes when a child is infected at the same time with a virus, their body's immune system is paying more attention to getting rid of the virus and a bacteria that may have been under control can sometimes cause an infection you know, coexisting with that viral infection. So these are all the host factors that we as physicians have the ability to make some control over. The things unfortunately that we don't have much control over are the virulence factors of the bacteria. So a lot of the bacteria that do cause 
the uh, recurrent infection in children, uh, uropathogens tend to be fimbri uh, have uh, fimbriae that can cause for attachment. Uh, they allow the attachment between the bacteria and the urethral cells and it's that attachment that is probably the most important first step for the bacteria then to invade into the body and cause infections. So a lot of the uropathogens have P. fimbriae that allow for that attachment. Two is that, uh, you know, children who are on antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, sometimes we will get a bacteria that has acquired resistance to the antibiotics that we have them on, and so now they have a breakthrough infection. So these are things that uh, the bacteria, the virulence factors of the bacteria that are also equally important, but unfortunately we don't have much control over other than just being good stewards of antibiotic prophylaxis and only using it when absolutely appropriate. How do you manage your children with urinary tract infection with abnormal ultrasound scan? So when you have a child that's referred to you with a supposed urinary tract infection, I think the first thing to do is to confirm that you're actually really treating a urinary tract infection and not just a positive culture. Because uh, the incidence of asymptomatic bacteria is not uncommon in children, especially children who have voiding dysfunction. They may have had a urine culture collected inappropriately and without any true symptoms of a urinary tract infection, but rather symptoms of voiding dysfunction. So what I would recommend is that uh, one, look at the culture results yourself. Two, always encourage the doctors to get a urine analysis and microscopy and look at these results yourself. Because if there's evidence of pyuria, which I would define as greater than 10 WBCs per high power field on that urine analysis, on the dipstick, if you have a positive uh, urinary um, nitrites, and also leukocyte esterase. So that combination plus pyuria in the setting of a single organism growing at greater than 100,000 colony count, if collected with a clean midstream catch, is okay evidence to suggest that, that you are really treating a urinary tract infection. Now, if you happen to be lucky enough that they did a cat specimen, <clears throat> you can drop the threshold down to about 50,000 colony form. But I would still check the urine analysis to make sure that you have positive nitrites and positive leukocyte esterase and pyuria, again, greater than 10,000, I'm sorry, greater than 10 WBCs per high power field. So now that you've confirmed that this child actually had a urinary tract infection, first goal is to treat them, get rid of that infection, make the child asymptomatic. And then you can start investigating what are the child's risk factors for, one, why did they get that infection in the first place, and what's going to put them at risk for ongoing infections in the future. The first test that almost every single um, body of pediatrics out there, whether it's the American Academy of Pediatrics, whether it's the um, National Institute of Clinical Effectiveness within the national healthcare system, um, have all suggested that a good screening tool to use would be a renal bladder ultrasound. And in addition to looking at the kidneys and bladder, I would urge you to ask your sonographers to look at the rectum and make sure that there's not a distended rectum. Look at the bladder wall thickness. Is this a thickened bladder that suggests that there might be some outflow obstruction, whether it's acquired or um, an, uh, congenital? And also look and see if there's appropriate emptying happening. Because these are all important things that you want to see on that ultrasound, and not just is there hydronephrosis or not. If you have an abnormal ultrasound, depending on what that abnormality is, if it's you know, showing that there's a distended rectum behind the bladder, then that's a child with dysfunctional voiding. You don't need to refer them to a urologist or a surgeon. You could manage that child yourself as a pediatrician, work on the constipation, combination of medical therapy, but also behavior modification with dietary modification and daily exercise. If it's hydronephrosis, if there's any evidence of scarring going on on the ultrasound, then that's serious stuff and would warrant further investigation under the supervision of either a pediatric surgeon or a urologist. The next step would probably be a, either a VCUG if the child is less than three years old. In older children, a VCUG is a rather unpleasant test to do, so we would advocate doing a top-down approach, which means start with the kidneys and work your way down to the bladder. There we would recommend getting a DMSA scan. Now the DMSA, uh, dimer dimer acid, is a radionuclide tracer that is a cortical binding agent, so it's going to be bound in the parenchyma of the kidney. It's going to give you really good definition of what the parenchyma looks like, are there parenchymal dropouts. If it's done during the acute phase of an infection, you're going to get photopenic areas due to inflammation. If it's done beyond three to six months after an infection, any photopenic areas suggest that these are real scars going on in the kidney. And any scars in the kidney are bad. 
Um, they do increase the risk of ongoing issues with chronic kidney disease, such as early onset hypertension, proteinuria, and especially in girls, it does increase their risk of preeclampsia during pregnancy when they become adults. So, younger children, VCUG, or in this part of the world, a MCUG, a micturating cystourethrogram. There you want to look and see, again, what's the bladder capacity? And you calculate the bladder capacity for a child less than two by taking their weight in kilograms, multiply by seven. And you want to see that the child's bladder capacity on the MCU is about 80% of expected bladder capacity. If it's less than that, probably not a normal bladder. If it's much greater than that, also not a normal bladder. Uh, in children older than two, you can take the cough formula, which is age in years plus two multiplied by 30. Once again, age in years plus two multiplied by 30, and that is going to give you a bladder capacity. So for example, a five-year-old child, five plus two, seven multiplied by 30, 210, 210 ml is their expected bladder capacity. So you want to see that the test is performed to fill the child's bladder, close to the expected bladder capacity, looking at the morphology of the bladder. Normally the bladder is nice and smooth. You should not see any trabeculations, any diverticuli, certainly no reflux. And then during the voiding phase, especially in boys, you want to look at the urethra and make sure that the urethra is patent, that it's got normal luminal caliber, that there's no evidence of any push urethral valves or any other strictures. Lastly, you want to look at the emptying phase of that study. The reason why we prefer for the first test a fluoroscopic study is that you get the additional benefit of the scout film that shows you the spine of the child. You can quickly look and see is there any spina bifida occulta going on with the vertebral bodies and also the all-important issue about constipation. For follow-up studies, you can do the radionuclide test, which uh, is much more sensitive, but it doesn't give you the additional information of the morphology um, of the bladder, of the ureters, of the renal pelvis, or of the spinal co of the uh, vertebral column or constipation. What are your top tips to our audience to prevent recurrent urinary tract infection in children? So when you're treating a child who has recurrent urinary tract infections, I think it's safe to assume that they all have some element of bowel bladder dysfunction and you have to treat them in conjunction because the bladder and bowels are so intimately related that dysfunction in one organ is going to cause dysfunction in the other. And so I put these children on a, uh, a six-step bladder retraining program and it's the same for boys or girls with one major difference. So the first thing is a time voiding program and uh, making sure that these children go to the bathroom on a regular schedule. We start off with every two and a half hours and then go up to three hours. There are watches that are available that have the ability to have multiple alarms built in that can be silent so the child doesn't draw attention to themselves at school. And we just say, you know, when the watch buzzes, take time out, go to the bathroom, empty your bladder. That's the first thing, time voids. Very important, very simple, and it prevents them from having urge incontinence, prevents them from being these infrequent voiders that only void once every eight hours. The second thing then is to make sure that they have the voiding posture that's appropriate to ensure appropriate emptying of the bladder. And this is where the bladder retraining differs, boys to girls. For girls, what we see is that a lot of times they will pull their underwear down to their knees, which forces their legs to be locked together, and then they perch on the bathroom. That makes their pelvic floor very tight, very contracted, and in some girls it predisposes them to a concept called vaginal voiding, where the urine comes out of the urethra, bounces off the labia, and goes back into the vagina. It causes significant vaginitis, pelvic pain, can cause post-void dribbling because all of the urine that's going to the vagina is now dribbling out in the underwear and can cause a, a lot of discharge too. So it's very distressing to the child. And the fix is so simple. Just have them take their underwear all the way off. So I tell them whatever you're wearing below your belly button should come all the way off. I want you to sit all the way back on the commode straight up with your legs apart. In the small children who are afraid that they're going to fall into the hole of the commode seat because they're so petite, I tell the parents either use a adapter for the commode seat or even better is to buy two small stools, put them on either side so the child can support their weight. If it's really challenging, then just have the child sit backwards facing the flush tank. And that gives them the support, allows them to spread their legs, and they can empty their bladder properly. For the boys, I teach them to, when they go to the bathroom, that they have to pull their underwear all the way down. It's not uncommon for a lot of boys to just try and pull their waistband down and try and pee over their waistband. <clears throat> the urethra in boys is positioned in the bottom part of the penis. So if you have a waistband that's pushing on the urethra, it's gonna make them have to push with more pressure so they don't empty their bladder all the, well, all the way, and also they'll have some urinary dribbling that comes out. That does two things. The lack of emptying completely the urethra or the bladder increases the risk of infections, 
that dribbling into the underwear is going to expose the head of the penis, especially in boys who have been circumcised, to chronic uh, irritation from the urine in the underwear, causes a urethritis, and can cause meatal stenosis. And so it's going to close off the urethra. The third step in the six step program is that they have to spend at least two minutes in the bathroom to ensure they empty their bladder all the way. Not uncommon for children to go in, okay mom, you make me go to the bathroom, run into the bathroom, pst, I'm done, and leave. They haven't taken the time to empty their bladder. Lack of complete emptying of the bladder is a big risk factor for urinary tract infections. So just teach them, either sing your ABC song or use an egg timer, give them something that they can relate to that gives them a reference point about how long they're taking to empty their bladder. Two minutes is not a long time. For some reason, the kids are like, oh, I can't miss a single second of my video game or my favorite TV show or whatever it is that's happening outside. It's so important, but they need to be taught that, you know what, put it on hold, take two minutes, go empty your bladder. Number four, there are certain food substances that make our bladder overactive. Luckily, they all begin with the letter C. We talk about the four C's, but I'm going to talk about the fifth C in a second. So the four C's are chocolate, I know, really bad, right? Chocolate, citrus, so lemonade, orange juice, carbonation, and it doesn't matter if it's pop or if it's just clear water, anything with carbonation. The fizz is carbon dioxide. It's going to mix with the water and become carbonic acid and irritable for our bladders to hold. That acid load makes our bones release calcium, so now we transiently become hypercalciuric. Calciuria increases dysuria, makes it painful to urinate. All these things are bad, so that's why the um, carbonation, whether it's from colas or whether it's from clear water, is not good for the bladder. And then the last thing is caffeine. And surprisingly, a lot of foods have caffeine in them, even without you thinking it's tea or coffee. So just look at the labels and avoid the four C's. So once again, chocolate, carbonation, caffeine, and citrus juices. The fifth C, just as important, and is included in the C's as well as its own bullet point in the six step program is constipation. And I would tell you that almost 100% of the children that I take care of who have urinary tract infections are at some degree of constipation, but everybody denies it. And so when you have that concern that the child's constipated but nobody's owning up to it, you can just do a simple KUB, kidney, ureter, or bladder x-ray of the abdomen, and that'll show you if the child's constipated or not. It is important to try and get that KUB or abdominal x-ray on a day after the child's had a bowel movement because if they haven't had a bowel movement in three days, then the parents are going to say, well, that's why they look that way and they're not going to buy your concept of that the child is constipated. So try and do it on a day that they've already had a bowel movement. And then treating constipation is not just with medications, but it's got to be a lifestyle change. So making sure that they are eating the appropriate number of fruits and vegetables, drinking and hydrating well. And I teach the kids, all of them, a simple trick of hydration. I tell them that the only time their urine can be yellow is when they wake up in the morning because they've been fasting all night. But after that first urination of the day, the rest of the day when they urinate, they should have clear urine and that's a sign that they're appropriately hydrated. That does two things. One, it makes you have dilute urine so it's easier for your bladder to store. Two, it makes you have an appropriate urinary volume during the day so you're washing out the bladder urethra. And three, it dilutes all the solutes in our system so it reduces your risk of kidney stones. So lots of benefits from appropriate hydration. The last step, number six, is uh, using probiotics. And these probiotics don't have to be prescription strength probiotics. Uh, it's very cheap and effective to just get these kids to eat yogurt made with active cultures. Uh, you have, <clears throat> have to be careful that uh, you're watching the sugar content in the yogurt because some of these yogurts have a lot of uh, flavoring in them. So I say just plain yogurt, active cultures, one or two tablespoons full a day is going to give your child the probiotics. Um, the probiotics in yogurts are the lactobacillus, acidophilus, or bifidus. And these bacteria are non-pathogenic in the human being and go and bind to the binding sites, the receptor sites on the urethelium, occupy them so that the pathogenic bacteria can't get into the system. So six steps towards healthy urinary tract and avoiding urinary tract infections. Professor, it was wonderful having you here today. Thank you. My pleasure and privilege to be here and what a wonderful opportunity for NMC Royal and Cincinnati Children's Hospital to come together for the betterment of the health of the children in this region. So thank you for having me. Likewise.